So in verse 12 in Titus chapter 2, we're looking at this idea of grace and, and what is grace and, and, and what, what's this conversation, this idea. And, and Paul writes this letter to this guy named Titus, and, and Titus gets it. He's in his early 30s. It's a very young community named, uh, called Crete, and, and it's like it's a very, it's like um, it's an area where people are just coming in and out of all the time. Money's moving hands all the time. Um, I, it's just like, it's a convergent city. It's a city where, where a lot's happening. We're moving and shaking. And so I want to read this one verse, and then I want us to kind of dissect and look and, and, and maybe reshape kind of some of our thoughts and understandings of what grace is. It says this, Titus chapter 2, verse 12. In the Passion Translation, it says, This same grace teaches us how to live each day as we turn our backs on ungodliness and indulgent lifestyles. And it equips us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. You are here. You are guiding us. We... Um, thank you that we get to worship you. Thank you that we get to learn more about you. We thank you um, that we get to be guided by you. Um, we thank you for um, carne asada and tacos and guacamole, cilantro, um, with a, just a spritz of lime um, on corn tortillas because it is Hispanic day, not white people day. Um, and so we're going to eat corn tortillas today. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Grace is, grace is just one of those funny things that we love and we have an idea of. And as a parent, like, I want to show my kids grace. And the other day, um, my, um, my son, I have three kids, a seven-year-old named Boston, five-year-old named Beckham, and then uh, perfection in a little girl named Berkeley Bell. She turns two on May 22nd. I can't believe she's going to be two. And, you know, uh, 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 Boston, he's like... Uh, but Boston's, Boston's funny. Boston's got a, like a personality. He's very sarcastic. He thinks he's funny even when he's not being funny. Like he, he's, he, he's just, he, and like if, if like he doesn't know you and you're like, what's up, Boston? He's like, cool. <laughs> Anything else? Like, like he's not interested in those kinds. Beckham is like a Labrador. Beckham loves everything and everybody and will hug you. And like we fear for him because he's like, stranger? Like what are you talking about? Like... Stranger doesn't mean danger. Stranger means potential fun time. And like, <laughs> like he's just he's just a funny kid. And then like and then like Berkeley, she's just hilarious and got this little sprout for a pigtail and um and she's wearing overalls today because I dressed her and, I, and there were shorts and she's so cute. And so like like those are my kids. And and, and Boston the other day, uh, Kara makes Boston's lunch. She's in first grade and makes his lunch every day and um, except for Fridays, it's pizza day. And um, and she got his lunch already, and, and he got his lunch pail and cute little lunch pail, and, and like she always puts his snack on top for snack time because he's in first grade, so you get snack time. And and then this day she put candy on his uh, lunch pail as well, which is a big deal in our house. Like we're not a big candy family, we're not a lot of sweets, we're a water only family. Um, and, and so like like it was a big deal, and you can thank the Easter Bunny for that. And so he's got a little piece of candy, and it's the little one that looks like a uh, like a hamburger um, in Spanish, is hamburguesa. And so like here he's got. Like, like this moment, like he's got, and I see it and I'm cooking for, I'm cooking breakfast for them because I get the kids out the door and I'm actually making bacon and eggs like a good, good father. And, so, and, uh, and so I, I, and I see the candy and, and then I turn around and I'm, you know, flipping eggs and, and, and doing all the thing. And I turn around and it's gone. The candy's gone. And I see Boston standing there and like, we make eye contact and instantly he's like, <gasps> Like, he knows, I know that I know that he knows that he knows that I know. Like, we're in, like, this moment, and he's just like, mm. and, like, I say, Boston, did you take the candy that was on top of your lunch pail? And he just looked back at me like, <sighs> could you repeat the question? <laughs> Boston, did you take the candy off your lunch pail? And again, like, he just stared at me. You could just see his little mind working. Like, like you could see the angel and the devil on his shoulders. Like, that doesn't make sense to lie. But I don't want to lie. It makes sense. Like, you could just see this torment. 
And typically, I would, like, if I find him in that moment, you know, I'm a very heavy hand father and strict and militant, of course. And so, you know, I would bring the hammer down, if you will, um, on my child's life. Like, that's what I would do. But that moment, I thought, I'm, uh, like, I'm, I'm bacon and eggs, Dad. Like, 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 I'm toast and jam in the morning, Dad. Like, like I'm the best dad. And let's go. And so, and so I sat him down on the couch, and I sat down. He's standing there, and I read a book sometime. It's best to get eye level with them. So I get all eye level and I begin to talk to him about what he's done. And I begin to tell him about the grace and the love of God that he sent his son. Somehow I'm relating this little fake candy hamburger to the death and resurrection of Jesus. I don't know. I preach everywhere. Okay. And so like, like Boston's tracking with me. He's taking notes because note takers are history makers. And so like here we're having this moment and we're having this conversation. And I say, Boston, I'm going to show you grace because I love you just the way God showed us grace through his son. And you know what my son said to me? Okay. (laughs) And he just walked off. Ah, you little dirtbag. Like, you didn't learn anything and good luck. Like, I was so like, just, and you know what? It made me realize and that I don't think we're any different. That we know a lot about grace And we hear about God that gives us grace and will always forgive us and will never leave us nor forsake us. And so when we grab the candy and sin and we go to him because we've got guilt in our lives and we're like, oh, I feel guilty, like what I've done. And you go to God and you say, God, will you forgive me? And he does. And you're like, oh, cool. And we go back and we just keep living our lives. We're not changed by grace, but grace changes everything. Grace isn't something that comes into the world and it's like, oh man, that's so cool that Jesus died and rose from the dead and now I get to live willy-nilly and, and you know, spring break, let's party. Like, like, no, you were forgiven for those things, but we want to be changed because of grace, not rely on it as a crutch to lead our lives, that we want a relationship to lead our lives. So I want you to do this. Um, look to your neighbor and tell them what grace is out loud. You got to use your words. You got to like speak. We should hear. We should hear a, a volume in this room. Unless you're Jacqueline sitting alone. Jesus, Louise, can someone talk to Jacqueline? My word, awkward. All right, are we good? Have we talked about it? We talked about it. Feel good. Theologians in the room are like, well, it says. Uh, and I imagine that, I imagine, I would guess this, that many of our conversations and just kind of starters, you looked at your neighbor and you said, I think grace is. You ever have that moment where you don't really know what you're talking about, so you cover it up by I think? I think this happened. And, and I think it's, I, I think. <laughs> <Dang it. laughs> Most likely... <laughs> you try this. And most likely it's because we don't fully know or believe what we're talking about. We don't want to be wrong. We don't want egg on our face. So following God is one of those things that when you begin to walk with him and you understand his grace, you begin to be able to describe it to others and be able to walk with that. Like, like, like you say, I think, but I don't know if I really know what it is. And I want to define it for us. Um, th- this definition, that this kind of sentence that, that is written around it, it, it says this, grace is unconditional love toward a person who does not deserve it. That's us, guys. Like, like, it's unconditional love. We don't deserve grace, but because Jesus and because God loves us so much, God, excuse me, gave us Jesus so that we could have grace, so it would always be near to us. It's not something that's distant from us. It is something that is with us. Grace is unconditional love. Grace is Jesus coming to earth and being with us. The best action of grace ever in history is Jesus dying on a cross, rising from the dead three days later. That's the best action of grace. It will never be topped. It will never be changed. That is the encompassed conversation of grace. So if you looked at your neighbor and you said, Jesus, you're right. Jesus is grace. Jesus is grace. Second Corinthians says it this way. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus is grace. The love of God. God is love. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with 
you all. So the fellowship would be companionship, friendship, guidance. The Holy Spirit's with us. So if you ever are in church or reading your Bible and you hear Trinity, we serve a triune God. We serve a God that is in three parts. This is their functions. It's not that we have God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. They're different beings and, and, and they all are God. And we don't understand it. And they have like, like a business meeting on Monday morning at 8 a.m. through a Zoom call. Like that's not it. They are one, and these are their functions. God is love, Jesus is grace, and the Holy Spirit is our companion. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. That means it's a great Greek way of saying that he is everywhere, okay? So that means the moment you meet Jesus, his grace, because God loved you enough to create you, that his Holy Spirit is your companion, and you are filled. And there's another moment that you are baptized in the Spirit, baptized with his Greek word, baptized which would mean immerse, that you are fully inside, like he's fully on the outside of you. So as you look at this, God, if you ever like are struggling what the Trinity is, God is love, Jesus is grace, and the Holy Spirit is our companion. He is with us. And you won't understand who you are until you receive grace and give grace. So many of us, we've received his grace, but yet we've never given grace. We received that we're not perfect, that we're fallen, that we've got sin in our lives and brokenness, and we're thankful for that grace, but the moment a friend, the moment a coworker, the moment a spouse messes up, judgment, anger, disappointment, that I don't think you fully understand your identity of who God's created you to be until you receive and until you give grace. Grace is so important. I like When I look at my friendships, the best friends that I have are the ones that allow me to not be perfect that allow me to be a jerk, that allow me to struggle, that allow me to be guided, that allow me to um, lose my cool, and they don't write me off. They let me to say, I'm sorry. They say they're sorry. Like, those are the best type of people because no one likes the other side the moment, because otherwise you have to live a perfect life. But that's, that's not the idea. That, that, that's not the moment. That's a misunderstanding of what grace is because grace is amazing. That's the like best sentence I could come up with. Grace is like one of those, it's just amazing because it's the opposite of the way I want to respond. My flesh in Colossians says it craves sin. So my sin nature craves anger, craves destruction, it craves selfishness, it craves indulgence. So the opposite of that is grace. The opposite of that is love is better than anger. Forgiveness is, is, is better than judgment. Well, I think we struggle with this idea of grace sometimes because outside of Jesus on the cross and resurrection, we don't see grace that often in our lives. That you get pegged or you get labeled or you get identified as a mistake that you've made, a sin, if you will, and now our lives are pegged by that, <clears throat> opposed to being pegged by grace. Opposed to being pegged by love and care. Grace, it changes your perspective. It changes your lens. It changes your countenance. It changes your, 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 your identity. It changes your purpose. But grace is a process. Oftentimes we think that grace is like received and now I'm great. No, that's not it. There's a journey that you go on. We romanticize grace. We romanticize our relationship with Jesus sometimes. We make it into like this rom-com. We make it into like the notebook and like you're like, you're, you're just, you're with your best friend and like you and, you and Jesus are going to frolic through the fields together and then you'll end up in heaven and you won't skip a beat. Like, like that's not what it is. That's not the idea of what grace truly is. Grace is a journey. It's a process with the one who created you, with the one who died for you, with the one that's filled you. So that's what grace is. It's a journey. It's a process. So when you don't have grace, 
be okay, but recognize that it's a journey towards having grace in that area, towards having grace towards your kids, towards having grace towards your spouse, towards having grace towards coworker, towards having grace towards humanity, because humanity makes funny decisions all the time that don't make sense. And no one wants to be around a, a, a Christian that doesn't have grace. They're called religious people. For lack of a better term, I'll just go with this. They're not awesome. People who are near Jesus are awesome because they'll let you process life. They don't demand perfection. They say, you know what? Yeah, you were being an idiot, but it's okay. They don't hold it against you. They're able to grow with you, able to be with you. And I think... We romanticize it because we think grace is all about us and just being with Jesus. Well, yeah, that's true, but grace is all about us being in a relationship with Jesus and not being in hell. See, grace is a Jesus thing because it's a removal from hell thing. See, grace is a thing that's a part of our lives because the opposite is hell. You ever say that line, my life's a living hell? What you're saying is my life is absent from God. So a life that's absent from God, which is known as hell, which is a physical place that will happen and people will go to that are absent from God, that will look at him and say, I didn't know you, you didn't clothe me, and that's what will happen. It's because they're being removed from a relationship with God. They had an opportunity and they won't be with him. So grace is heaven, and the opposite of that is distance from God and not being a relationship with him. Jesus didn't die because he's nice. Jesus was like, you know what? God, I got an idea. I'm pretty giving. God's like, yeah, you are. Pretty good person. You gave me the last fry the other day at Chick-fil-A. Because we know God and Jesus eat at Chick-fil-A. You know what? I'll, I'll die for humanity. I'm interested in getting beaten to a pulp. Uh, really interested in um, yeah, being a teenager. That, was, that, that sounds fun. Um, woodworking. Cool. Splinters. I'm in dust in your nose, I'm down. Like that wasn't Jesus's moment in conversation. It was the identity and because he desired relationship, not because he's nice. He desires you, not because he's nice. He cares about you. He loves you. And that's what grace looks like. And reading this Titus chapter two, verse 12, I think there's two main points to it. And the first one is this. Grace is the greatest teacher. Grace will teach you more than tough love. Grace will teach you more than discipline. Those things are incredible. Disciplined people are incredible. Tough love are defining moments, but grace are moments that I'm able to learn more about the heart of God than anything else. Grace, I learn more about Jesus than anything else. And it says this, it says, this this same grace teaches us it means, it means there, there's coaching. It means there's schooling. It means, I mean, it means you don't have it yet. And we need to be taught how to live each day as we turn our backs onto ungodliness and indulgent lifestyles. We need to turn our back to those things. But grace, a.k.a. Jesus, is willing to teach us in all of these areas. Grace is God understanding that we're not going to get it right every time. So don't get it right. I wanted to rap right there. Get it right, get it right, get it right. Like, don't get it right. But allow God to journey with you so that you do get it right. I think so often we think like, God's mad at me. He's so disappointed in me. I can't do these things. That's you imposing who you think God is, not who God is. And that's what your identity and what grace is. No, no, grace is that moment. He's like, you know what? They're not going to get it right every time. But because my son died for them, but because he rose for them, I'm going to be able to give grace in these moments. I'm going to be able to love them no matter what. I'm able to walk with them. Grace is better than tough love. He's saying people that live ungodly and indulgent lifestyles, there's an option. Because it says it teaches you. So who's teaching you? Because you're learning. I mean, somebody's in your ear. Somebody's talking to you. Somebody's guiding you. Uh, I like to um, golf a lot. (laughs) Phil Mickelson's here. And so, like, I like to to golf a lot. And um, 
love golfing. I, I think it's so much fun. And I was golfing the other day, and um, I thought to myself, I think golf's a lot like parenting. No one's actually good at it. Like, there's the people who, like, are on TV, and, like, they're good golfers. And then, like, there's people who wrote, like, parenting books, and they're probably not even that good of parents, but, like, this is the perception that they want to be as parents. Like, but, like, I parent, I got three kids, and I feel like, I, and you parent, and I watch you parent, and no one's actually good at it. We're all just trying, like, the best version of who we are. Like, like everybody's got an opinion. Can we co-sleep? Can we not? Can we have a binky? Can we have not have a binky? Like, you know, you know formula, not for like, like, we all get this idea and these opinions and no one's actually right. Okay, let's just stop there. And so like, we're, but we're all trying the best that we can. But when I come home to parent from work and I see my kids and I said, oh gosh, I've just had a day. And we ever had that? I've had a day. Oh my, I'm too tired. You know what? I, I, you know what? I don't connect with my kids. They're not, they're, it, you can get annoyed by your kids sometimes. Don't tell them that, but you can. I like, there's those moments where that happens, but the moment that we stop parenting our kids, the world will have a greater voice in their lives than you will. The Bible says that I'll raise my house. You, for, for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. That doesn't happen by omnipresence. That happens by presence. That happens by dialoguing. That happens by, you don't get to skip church. That happens by, you're going to youth group. That happens by those moments. Like, I remember growing up, and one of my friends got grounded from, like, from, from our youth group called, called, like, View Youth, like, that kind of thing. I went to school the next day. I was like, where'd you go? Why weren't you there? Like, we had a great time. And he's like, I got grounded. And I was like, I was like, what do you mean you got grounded? He's like, yeah, I did this, that, and the other. I was like, that's bad stuff. And, and he's like, yeah, I got grounded from church. And I was like, so you're telling me that you're, that, like, you, you screwed up and they took you from church? I don't get it. I mean, like, like we bring a distance and the more distance you have from God, the more the world will influence your life. The more distance you have from God, the more that the world will influence and dictate and determine the life that you live because it'll be the dominant, uh, uh, like, like the, the, uh, the, the first voice in your mind. That's what everybody else is doing. That's what I'm going to do. That's what God thinks about me. Like, that's the reality of that. The more distance from God, the more the world will shape me. But grace will teach you these things because it's not easy to do. We need grace. It says, turn your back. Turn your back on these things. Like, like what do you need to turn your back on? What is it that you live? What is it that you view? What app do you need to delete? What bottle do you need to throw away? What, what countenance do you have that you just need to turn your back? See, I think our world's lost the art of confrontation because the greatest confrontation you could ever make is the one with the devil and just say, I, I ain't about that. I'm not gonna live that because God, uh, ungodly living is anything that's not godly. So when you look and examine your life and notice that things aren't godly in it, remove them and turn your back on them. There's a reason why you'll live different from everybody because there's a light in you that isn't in others. And the world needs your light, not your darkness. The world needs his light, not darkness. The world needs your grace that you have through God, not anger and disappointment. And I knew you'd let me down. They get enough of that. See, Christians need to live a life that they talk about what they're for more, far more than what they talk about what they're against. Through the history of Christianity, we've talked about what we're against, but what if we took the narrative and the notion of talking about what we're for? That list is already long, but this list is really short. I'm for God. I'm for the things of God. You can go through this. I'm again, people, want, people want to trap me all the time, a bunch of trappers. They'll be like, hey, Kyle, hey, Kyle, hey, Pastor. It usually starts with this. Excuse me, Pastor Kyle. Um, <laughs> And I go, excuse you. Um, and, uh, and they'll be like, what, what, what do you think about weed? What do you think about, you know, depression? What do you think about, you know what I think about? I think about God. Yeah. Because if it's not godly, I'm not going to do it. And that's your journey with God, not my journey with God. That's your getting to that place. You don't need to live by my opinions. You need to live by the voice of the Lord, yeah. who's already inside of you, who's already baptized you, who's already guiding you. Good. Man, this is good. <laughs> crap. Um, we could, I'm not going to stop because there's more, but I mean, these are just like, this is, this is what grace is. Don't miss it. Don't mess it up. Like, like just, I just want you to understand this so desperately. 
so bad. I also want the air conditioning on. I am so hot. I'm wearing a gray shirt. I, I, don't, I usually don't pit out, but I ain't going to worship. Jesus, please. Um, I, um, I, I love, I, love I, I don't play favorites, but if I played a favorite, like I love Peter in the Bible. Peter's one of the disciples and don't play favorites. Talk, talk to Joseph about that. Like, uh, so like Peter, I, I just, I, I think I like Peter so much because I identify with Peter. I like, I see Peter not living perfect. I, I, I see Peter messing up sometimes, but I see Jesus always with him. You see what I'm saying? Like, like, like Peter makes, like, ch- check this out. P- Peter one time in uh, Mark chapter eight, verse 32, Peter rebuked Jesus. He okay, rebuke is like, 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 like a Bible way of saying, like, called him out. So that means that Peter, Peter, looks at Jesus, a.k.a. God, says, Jesus, my office, 7 a.m. Uh, excuse me, Jesus, I've been, uh, I don't know how to put this, but your TPS report, it's just not getting filed the right time, and it's getting pretty difficult, and, you know, I'm pretty disappointed in you, and, um, I hope your performance will get a little bit better. And I believe in you. Well, you know, you're God. I believe in you. And there's more that you have to offer. Like, he looked at Jesus and called him out. And God's like, <laughs> you're so stupid, Peter. I mean, like, there's just that moment. That, like, But you know what? I think that's so similar to us. That we look at God and say, God, you know, if I was God, this wouldn't happen. Man, if I, you know, God, your timeline, not so awesome. God, you know what? If I, you know, you messed up in this, this, and this. And there's all these little things that we correct God. We don't realize what we're doing, but when we hear this sentence, all of a sudden we realize that we are correcting God, deity, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who sent us Jesus. And we look at him and say, God, you're not doing it right. Well, Peter moved on from there. And in Matthew chapter 14, verse 30, he lost his faith. He went to church and he was like, this is how we're going to fight our battles. And you got all excited and you're going to go do something for the kingdom. Then you got outside and you're like, no, I'm going to sink. You look one moment, you're going to fight your battles. And the next moment you're like, ah, I'm not going to do that. One moment you're on this mountaintop with God. And the next moment you're like, ah, I'm in a valley. Because all of a sudden he looked at the circumstance and he stopped looking at God. And he lost his faith and he began to sink. And how often in our lives that we looked at our circumstance became more important than God? That we saw and we thought we could overcome it, but it just wasn't going to happen. And then lastly, Peter kept it up in Luke chapter 22, verse 61. He denies Jesus three times. Here Jesus is like, like getting beaten here Jesus is like the man. Here, here Jesus is like going through the worst moments of his life. And his right-hand guy who he can trust. Three separate times, I don't know him. I don't know him. And then the third time, while Jesus is standing at Caiaphas' home, would have been an eye distance of Peter where this fire would have been on this balcony. The third time he looks at this girl and says, I don't know him. I don't hang out with him. I don't run with him. Within an eye shot of Jesus. And there isn't a moment in all of these denials. There isn't a moment in all of this rebuking. There isn't a moment in this losing of faith that Jesus says, yeah, you are who I thought you were. You punk. You didn't make it. You'd never live up to what I thought you would. It's not good enough. No, when Jesus returns and spends 40 days back with the disciples and he walks with them, the third time he shows up to them, He meets with Peter, and Peter puts his tunic back on. He jumps out of the boat. He swims to Jesus. He gets there, and Jesus is making him like Eggs Benedict. I don't know what kind of fish it was, but let's say it was salmon. It's like salmon Eggs Benedict from like Moby Cafe. There's like enough for like two days, even though I don't need that much. Indulgent lifestyles, calm down, Moby. It's called gluttony, sin. And so like, so we're like, I love that. Okay. Um, That's a whole nother sermon. Um. But just as Peter denied him three times, Jesus restored Peter three times. Just as Peter stood there and said, I don't know that cat. 
I don't, no, 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 that guy, no, no, I don't run with him. No, I, I don't know him. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he brought him back. He said, I'm still going to build my church on you. And I still love you. And I think so often we look at the things that we've done. We look at our circumstances as being more important than God. Because he's always interested in restoring you because he's always interested in his character and his character is always grace. Always grace. What if we lived like that? What, what, man, what if we just lived that grace life? I bet you'd never have to invite someone to church. I bet you they'd just follow you to church. I bet you'd never have to convince someone that God's real. Because they say, man, there's something real about you. I, I, I bet you. You look so much like Jesus. I don't remember Jesus saying, hey, come to church. I remember Jesus being like, hey, we are the church. Hey, we're going to love people. Hey, there's needs. We're going to answer those needs. I'm going to go to Nicodemus' house. I'm going I'm to hang out with the dirty. I'm going to hang out with the gross. I'm going to hang out with the broken. Not only does it teach you, but grace equips you. Grace gives you tools that life won't ever give you. Grace gives you an identity that life won't ever, that our world won't ever give you. It says this, it says, godliness and lifestyles, it says, and it equips us to live. Okay, now I know you all identify with this. Okay, and so I know the, the, the Christians in the room. A self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Like when I look around and I'm like, oh, Jacqueline, self-controlled. Oh, Kristen, upright. <laughs> oh, my word. Caden, godly. This is not the case. I remember when I was a sophomore in high school, I was on a football team and my coach for the game, starting court, I got called up varsity and starting corner or whatever. He couldn't play. And coach looked at me and said, okay, Kyle, you're going you're gonna to start. I'm like all excited. And he's like football talk, like breathing, like just yelling at me and like spitting on me because that's what you do is football. And he's like, you played varsity soccer last year and you're, you're going you're to play varsity football this year. It's the same thing and you're going to crush it. I don't know if you like just, like, you don't need to like check me out, but like my body not built for football. Like Texas forever or Birkenstocks forever. Like calm your life. And I like, I like stood there and I'm like believing him. And then like he walked away and I just like, and like I, I looked down and I was like, uh-uh, I'm going to die. Like they're big, they're like men, they're like angry. Like, like is no one concerned about my head? Like I know we haven't done enough con concussion stuff, but like I'm going to die out here. And I did. And, and I think we read a list like, like that in... in and we think, like, I could never live that godly, that, that, that self-controlled, that upright. I, I, I'm more of like a like, like selfish, like lazy and godless. Like, I don't identify with any of these things. But grace will equip you with the tools to live those ways. It doesn't mean that you'll live that way out of the womb. It means you'll live that way through a process. And grace gives you the opportunity. Like, you're like, I'm just trying to be a husband, just trying to be a wife, just trying to be a good employee, just trying to live, just, try, just trying. And this isn't even a list that's on your radar. But I think we need to add this to the top of our radar, and those things will benefit from all of this. The, better, the more uh, 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 self-controlled you are, the better husband you're going to be. The more upright you're going to be, better employee you're going to be. The more godly you are, the better all around you're going to be. Like, we need to rotate the list, and this needs to be at the top of it. But Jesus says, like, I'm going to walk with you on this journey and be with you. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18 says this, it says, rather you must grow. It doesn't say like, rather you've, you're already the grace and, you know, awesome person in the knowledge of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. It says, rather you must grow. The Bible's telling you that it will, that God will journey with you. That God's okay with your non-perfection. That God's okay that you don't get it all right. That God's okay that you don't read your Bible every day. That God's okay. He's still God even when you don't spend time with him. But he still desires you to spend time with him. He just still desires you to be with him. 
He says that you must grow. See, grace gives you the tools to live the way God intended. But that doesn't mean you will every time. Grace gives you the tools. I want to close with this. Um, you can put your notes down, different stuff like that. Um, my friend, he's a, uh, he's a police officer. And he's so, he's so cool. He's, he's just awesome. And we've been friends for almost 10 years now. Like nine years. And he's been doing this for a while. And the other day, like he regularly does, like when he does like a cool drug bust, he'll like text me like, hey, um, God, we're, we're going to pick up all this heroin. I'm like, oh, tell me about it. And like live vicariously through him. And I'm like, I just talked to another sinner. Um, he's like, I busted drugs. I was like, that's so cool. And yeah, not that drugs are cool. Um, anyways. But then like heavy things, he'll text me and be like, hey, I got to deal with this. And can you pray for me? And always absolutely praying with him and check back in with him. Because, man, that life, that job, that's difficult. The other day, Text me said, "Hey, I'm going to a um, going to a uh, scene where a three year old just lost its life and his life. And do you pray for me? That's just heavy. That's terrible. Absolutely. And instantly, I'm emotional. Like you know, I got kids and can't imagine this. These parents and so I don't hear from him. And the next day, I call him. How are you? What's going on? And he goes, "It was like the greatest tragedy I've ever been a part of my life." I was like, tell me more. Like, tell me what, what happened. And just three year olds in the parking lot and got hit by a car and lost his life. It's absolutely terrible. And dad's there. Gets to the scene and very emotional. And he's seen horrible things and still very emotional. And he and his partner are assigned to the dad. He's with the dad. The dad's emotional and dad pulls himself together and he says, Hey, um, I want to talk to the lady. He said, like, typically when it comes to crime scene stuff, you do not do that. That's hysteria, it's anger, it's a myriad of emotion, but something settled in his spirit. So he said, okay. Walks this dad who just lost his three-year-old little boy, who's a twin, over to this lady who's beside herself, and as you can imagine. And he didn't know what this guy was going to say. But he looked her in the eyes and said, I forgive you. He said, I forgive you. He said, my son's in heaven, sitting on Jesus' lap. And someday, we'll be reunited. I mean, I've told this story three times a day. I still cry. Like, I was dumbfounded when he told me that. See, grace... Grace will cut through the most hardened heart. Grace will soften the hardest of hearts. Grace changes everything. Grace takes sin and brokenness, hurt and pain, and it gives it to God. And I think oftentimes we have a difficulty to give grace because we've never allowed God to grace us. We've never accepted his grace for things in our lives. So how could we in turn give something that we don't have? Give something we've never experienced. Give something that we don't participate in. Give something. That's why we don't do it. Only to come to find out this father had lost his son is a pastor from Brazil who planted a church up here in a high, dense Brazilian population, Portuguese-speaking area. He said within about an hour or so, about 20 to 30 people from their church showed up and filled this Safeway McDonald's parking lot with prayer. Grace changes everything. Everything. Everything most hardened of situations, the most broken situation I've ever heard. Grace penetrated it and saved it. He said that coworkers that day who have seen worse 
we're in shock and we're in awe. But what if we lived that grace life? Dialogued, loved, cared, allowed people to not be perfect. Because I look at that story and I'm like, yeah, right. I'd love to think as the pastor, that's what I would do. But I don't know. I don't need to know. But I do know that his actions represented the actions of Jesus because of his clear proximity to Jesus. The closer you are to the heart of God, the more you'll act like the heart of God. Amen? I've gone too long. Let us, uh, I almost said let us pray. Let us pray. Um, Let's pray and I want to honor our kids and kids, uh, dream teamers, and uh, move us along. Amen? Can we stand to our feet? I'm going to pray you out of here.